On, on this happy occasion, I think it is appropriate for me to begin by wishing everyone namaste. <laughs> As some of my Singapore friends say, that I may look Chinese, but I'm actually an Indian. Um, this is a very happy occasion for the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, the Dean Kishore is away um, traveling the world, marketing his new book, and I must make a plug for his book, The New Asian Hemisphere, which is a very good, provocative book. But today, we are, we are met here to launch in Singapore another brilliant book by Minister Kamal Nath, India's Century. I thought I'd bring it along and also with a bookmark just to show you that I've actually done my homework. <laughs> um, let me just say a few words about the minister. The minister has been involved in politics uh, for many years, um, beginning as a youth worker for the Congress Party. And for the last 28 years, he has successfully won election and re-election to represent a rural constituency called Chinwara. This is a constituency which is not only rural but forested and has many tribal peoples. I first came to know Minister Kamal Nath when he was um, India's Minister for the Environment and Forest. And as some of you will know that I had the onerous task of um, chairing both the preparatory committee for the Earth Summit and then in Rio, the main committee itself. I, can, um, I want to say publicly this afternoon <coughs> that the collective enterprise in Rio would have failed if not for a few key individuals the Minister for Environment of India was one of them. The Minister for the Environment of China was another. The chairman of the Group of 77, a wonderful man from Pakistan, Jamshid Marker, was another. And I was truly blessed because on that particular occasion, June 1992, as you know, the United States was having a presidential elections and George H.W. Bush had decided to abdicate the expected U.S. leadership role in order not to antagonize his own right wing. And I was truly blessed that the European Union stepped forward. And by the luck of the law, luck of the draw, the chairman of the Council of Ministers of the European Union at that particular moment was the Netherlands, which played a truly, truly constructive role. The, Kamal will remember that uh, the negotiations in Rio were protracted, tense, often fractious. Um, although not a member of the Indian delegation, but being close to it, I used to brief him at the end of each day on what was going on behind the scenes. And then one day when things were really stormy, it looked very bleak, he uh, pulled me aside, um, blinked at me and said, Tommy, don't worry. When it comes to the crunch, you can count on my support in order to achieve consensus on a fair and balanced package of compromise. And he delivered. And so I will always be grateful to you, Kamal. To me, you're one of the heroes of Rio. But more recently, Kamal Nath has been India's Minister for Commerce and Industry. And I think I will, I hope I don't make you blush if I say that you are probably the first such minister who has conceptualized a coherent roadmap for India's trade policy. You have played a constructive role both in, in, in multilateral negotiations at WTO, for example, in regional negotiations and also in bilateral negotiations. My foreign minister, George Yeo, um, is, is not here and he wanted me to tell you that he would have come if he didn't have to go to Cairo to attend the second 
Asia Middle East Dialogue. But he wanted me to acknowledge publicly his gratitude to you. He said it was during your tenure as minister that we managed to close the negotiations between India and Singapore for the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, CHECA. He said, you're a tough negotiator. And I, I told him, yes, from my experience in Rio. But he said, you were thoughtful, constructive, and always look for win-win solutions. And since the concluding of CHECA, I think economic relations between our two countries and economies have prospered. And I think you have played no small part, Kamal, in bringing this about. So I want to say that uh, we are very proud of you in Singapore. Um, there are over 200 people in the audience, most of whom are members of your fan club. And it is now with very great pleasure that I invite you to say a few words about your book, India Century. Thank you, Tommy, for your very kind words. And uh, I want to say I'm delighted to be here at this great institution, an institution which uh, has a vision of the future, an institution which uh, is now recognized the world over as uh, an institution of excellence uh, in governance. And uh, uh, I am fortunate here that uh, a book which I wrote, I never thought I'd write a book. I thought uh, uh, sometimes when I retire, perhaps I'll write a book. Uh, it was uh, in New York, I'd gone to address Columbia University, when McGraw Hill asked me that uh, I should, uh, uh, invited me to write a book. I brushed it aside because uh, I said I'm in active politics. And as you know, politics in India is highly combative. Uh, I was saying this morning that we are the largest democracy and we are the rowdiest democracy. So I said, I'll be killed for what I write. And in India, everywhere in the world, you're killed for what you write. But in India, you're not only killed for what you write, you'll be killed for what you don't write. But somebody will say, why the, hell didn't you, why the hell didn't you say this? So I brushed it aside and never thought of it, that I'd write a book. Uh, in any case, the pressures were too, too many. <clears throat> but McGraw-Hill pursued me, and they said that I must do a book. They said, we've had economists, we've had journalists, uh, we've uh, uh, had a uh, variety of people write on India. And um, we've never had a politician write from a different perspective on India. Well, after several months, I thought that uh, perhaps I should do a book I should write a book with a different perspective. And I had the, uh, I had the fortune of uh, seeing a very wide spectrum representing a district which is one of the poorest districts in the country, uh, which has 1.9 million voters, covering 14,000 square kilometers, uh, many times the size of Singapore. And uh, uh, I know, Tommy, here elections are uh, one of my minister friends here, I was here in Singapore, and uh, it was election time. I was told elections are going to be in the next couple of days. So he gave me an appointment in the daytime. I said, the minister giving an appointment when elections are going on. So I said that, I asked him, when do you campaign? He said, I go home in the evening, I go up the building, go up the elevator, and that's my campaign. And people are all working in the day. They don't want to be disturbed late in the evening. And... Uh, he goes to one or two buildings, high rises, and that's his campaign. That's the electorate. Uh, I thought it's so different uh, to India. Uh, so when I decided that uh, as a politician I must write a book, I thought the first thing was that I shouldn't write about politics. Uh, I'd save that up for a moment when I'm not in active politics, uh, when I've retired, retired voluntarily not compulsively. <laughs> uh, so I started writing. I started uh, on my dictaphone. I started on the dictaphone. I sit in the plane and hold it as close, hold the, uh, the recorder as close to my mouth because of the sound. 
and record all kinds of things, thoughts and stray thoughts and uh, dictate out things. And I had somebody transcribe it. And I kept doing this, sometimes being repetitive, sometimes thinking that I hadn't been funny enough, I must be more funny, sometimes thinking that I got too technical. Uh, but the whole idea was how do I make it user friendly and yet give it content. Now, if I just made it user friendly, like somebody picked it up at the airport, they would say, you know, what does this guy know? He doesn't even know any figures, he doesn't know anything. On the other hand, if there were too many figures, too many statistics, somebody said this is a boring book, one of his assistants has written it for him. Um, so the challenge was to uh, make it user friendly, but yet give it content. Uh, so these transcriptions were made, and I'd go through transcriptions, and the transcriptions are read through. Uh, I almost gave her the book, but when I read what I dictated, uh, I thought I'd get killed. I planned that I wouldn't say anything about politics, but somehow politics kept creeping in. It was so much in the system that to sometimes to explain something, um, sometimes to justify something, uh, I had to do a lot of editing. And I think the toughest part of the book was the editing was the editing which was required to be done because I thought that this will be controversial. This, people would say, it's partisan. So I wanted to go above being partisan, above being controversial. Uh, but yet, write a feel-good feel good book on India. And um, almost 40% or 50% of what I dictated, I never used. Now, why didn't I use it? What was I writing? Uh, what was the architecture I had in mind? What was the road map? Well, the architecture was that, you know, many times I've heard people say, oh, you know, India had those wasted years. India had the wasted years after independence without realizing how complex this, our country is. Uh, on one hand, we talk of this 8 9% growth, but on the other hand, um, we miss out the 300 million people less than $1 a day that there is the India you see through your TV screen, your laptop screen, and even through Sunil's phone screen now. Um, but then, there is, that's the virtual India, there is a real India. And where and how does the virtual India converge in terms of the economy, converge in the eyes of economists, in the eyes of politicians? Uh, that is the complexity uh, of India's uh, growth story. And it is that complexity which I tried to explain, pegging it on to my own district, of how when I went uh, uh, as a youngster to contest for the first time, uh, how different things were. It was much easier to get votes then, I must say, than it's what, what it is now. Uh, it's getting far more difficult to get votes now. But uh, nevertheless, uh, one, one still struggles through it. And how the aspirations of people uh, were changing. Uh, where at one point of time, uh, people in my district were only in relating to the world because they wanted salt. Uh, they only wanted salt, they had, they, they had no need. They didn't need me. They had no aspiration, they had no demands. Because uh, they believed that the psych was that all this is God-ordained. So what the hell can Kamal Nadu do for us if God wants it to be like this? So forget it. And much, um, a large part of the mythology of India is of things being God-ordained. Now, how do you govern a country? How do you represent a people? How do you steer them towards growth uh, where people believe so much is God-ordained? So, in this challenge, where you have a virtual India, you have a real India, you have an India which is now roaring to go. When we were uh, starting our reforms process in 1991, the challenge was we were in government. Those were the days when I was environment minister and uh, uh, Tommy. Uh, I learned so much from Tommy by seeing uh, uh, not only a skilled negotiator, but his diplomacy. I wasn't a diplomat, and uh, uh, I learned to mind my P.O.E.s, learned to mind my Q's from Tommy, uh, how smooth and suave he was in persuading. 
um, persuading the most difficult of countries um, to fall in line to have uh, the Climate Change Treaty. Uh, it was Rio, and it was the leadership of Tommy, which I said this morning in a program. It was really Tommy's leadership, for all of you who don't know. In uh, working on the treaty, many of the words in the Kyoto Protocol are Tommy's words. Uh, language, when we talked of common and differentiated responsibilities. Uh, I know how this was worked out. You remember, Tommy, how this was worked out? These were phrases, these were sentences, uh, which uh, became the bedrock uh, of the Kyoto Protocol and of the challenges we have on climate change today. So in 1991, when we were reforming, we were in our reform process, what was the reform process we had to follow? Here was a country which was, uh, we had the license Raj, we had this great uh, uh, beliefs in socialism, we had great leaders, and that's what I said in my book, that why did Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and I went into this, not now, but when we were going to the reform process, I said, if we got to reform, that means what we were doing was wrong. Uh, but what were we doing, was it wrong at all? And I went into history, I went into records, I went into letters at that time. Uh, because again, we were embarking after our independence. The first challenge was independence in creating a united India, an India with diverse cultures, diverse languages. Uh, if you go north, everything changes. You go south, everything changes. Your food, your slippers, your pajamas, uh, everything changes. And uh, that's a fact. And here we were trying to carve out a country after independence in the framework of a democracy. No land records. Um, we had the Maharajas who had their own fiefdoms, who had their own kingdoms. And it was India. It was really that, that ethos of India, the ethos of tolerance. And that is the real tolerance the real story of India, the ethos of India, that the most tolerant society in the world uh, is Indians. My, my own district, they just want salt, couldn't be bothered. Uh, so when I looked into that, I found why Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru? Because we had no Marshall Plan, which Europe had in the rebuilding of Europe. India, uh, the, 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 the systems in Europe, the, capitalists, the cap capitalism weren't time tested. They got time tested 20 years later. And there was the Soviet system, there was the, the system in the United States and Europe and Western Europe. And why did Nehru choose this? So because he said, I, I can't risk for my country something which has not been tested, so let me take the safest route. And it was that safe route which helped us to start the reform process. The safe route of having this and that. It was not communism, it was not capitalism. Uh, and that was the compromise he made to himself. When he put all the economists together, everybody said, no, that has not been tested. We don't know whether that will work. Somebody said, this has not been tested. He said, then what do we do? So they, they really weren't wasted years. These were the years, um, years of learning, of really putting the country together in creating that infrastructure um, in our basic industries. So in India, when we started on this reform process, now what were we to do? We couldn't follow the reform uh, models in, um, uh, of South America and Central America, where the bubbles keep bursting. Uh, you had the models in, in East Asia, right here, not Singapore. Singapore doesn't have the complexity of India. But you had the, the models of East Asia, but then again there were problems here with the Asian crisis. India rode over all this. So we decided to have a calibrated form of reforms, which was very India-specific. We must remember that in India we had, when we started after independence, we were fed by the PL, United States PL 480, by food aid. And it was the agricultural revolution we had, where we became self-sufficient. How did India have the agricultural revolution? When I tell the Americans, not by the tractor, but by the bullock cart. And 
Americans are amazed. They say, Brother Bullock Cut? So, everything about India had to be so India specific. There were economic policies which were made after independence to integrate the country where one part of the country was made economically dependent on the other part, to create economic interdependence between states. Now that's not an economic philosophy, that's not a market philosophy, but that's a philosophy and a policy of integration of India, where you had a, a power plant 1,400 kilometers from coal, we were cutting coal to that power plant, made no sense, should have cut the electricity. But that was to create the economic interdependence between states for greater integration. And this economic dependence between states was again the architecture for the integration of India. This was the challenge that how do we have India-specific reforms? And I remember in 93, when I, uh, in 92, when I met Mr. Preston, the World Bank president at that time, and I went to, uh, uh, to the United States. Uh, it brought back fond memories in the last two weeks when I read about Bear Stearns, because the meetings we held were in the Bear Stearns big halls, right, where they were telling us about best practices until very recently, <laughs> financial best practices. Uh, now you know who has the subprime and you know who doesn't. So uh, it was then that the United States and Mr. Preston told me, you know, India never going to make it. It's a classic case of a nation going down. I said, but we are reforming. He said, this is not enough, this can't work. Mr. Preston came to India and we had a meeting and he said, and Tommy, you remember he came to Rio also. Um, he came to India and he told our then finance minister, our prime minister now, who's the architect of all this, Dr. Manmohan Singh, that uh, he's been telling me this can't work because there were few of us who used to go around the world trying to say that India is reforming, though it wasn't a direct part of my portfolio, but I was one of those who was assigned to go around the world to tell the India story. And everybody said it's not going to work. And suddenly it started working. It suddenly started working in the last few years, last several years. Now that was how it was meant to be. Because, as I said, we had calibrated. We had calibrated for Indian industry to accept. We had calibrated our globalization, our process of engagement, engaging with the world. We didn't, we had no trade agreements. The only trade agreement we had was with Nepal and Bhutan. And the next one, a small one with Sri Lanka, and another very small one covering 60 items or 70 items with Thailand. And the big one we had was with Singapore. Uh, that's, that, that's the biggest agreement we, we had, was with the Singapore Economic Cooperation Agreement. And uh, I must pay tribute to S Senior Minister Goh for his persistency. And uh, the first foreign visitor uh, in this tenure of ours in government, the first foreign head of government who came to India was Prime Minister Goh at that time. And he said that, you know, this is what I started. And he told me that, Kamal, I want you to really work at this and make it happen. I was just now, before coming here, with Minister Lim, who negotiated this. And the several trips coming here, as I said in the morning on Sundays, so the first thing, whenever I meet him, I said, well, I won't ask for an appointment on a Sunday, but the only times I had to travel was on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, um, we signed it, uh, and today, our engagement, the process with Singapore, and some people used to ask me, why Singapore? You know, Singapore is not a big market, and uh, what are we going to do? We had great problems, and Singapore said that we must have tax reduction on beer. So we said, you know, if every Indian starts drinking Singapore's beer, Singapore will have a problem supplying it. They won't have enough beer to go around Singapore. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> we, we had a good agreement. It was a learning process for us. It was a learning process for us because this was the first time we were engaging with the world. And Singapore had had several agreements. They had all the experts. We were still learning. And walking through this agreement helped us to learn also. 
helped us to learn in our agreements with the ASEAN, with the European Union, which we are now negotiating. So, well, in the book, I try to put flavors of all this, flavors of all this without getting heavy on a single point. I didn't want to make it about me. Uh, I didn't want to make it about my experiences with other leaders. Uh, as I said, I'm saving that up, right? And, uh, uh, but I wanted to give a flavor of all kinds, a flavor which helps somebody to understand the diverse flavors of India, the challenges of India, and that India is not while it is its tigers and its jungles and its forests and its deserts, and we say it's the incredible India. India is also the credible India. Thank you. We are also very privileged this afternoon to have two very distinguished commentators, and I would like to um, briefly introduce the first of the two. Um, Sunil Bhakti Mittal is one of the most admired business leaders and entrepreneurs of India. His life journey um, is a truly remarkable one. He graduated from the University of Punjab at the age of 18 in 1976. He borrowed 1,500 US dollars from his father and together with a few friends um, started a bicycle shop. In his breakthrough came in 1982 when on a visit to Taiwan, he saw push button phones which were then not available in India. He got a franchise and he returned to India and started manufacturing push button phones. Then his real breakthrough came in 1992. This was um, during the period when Manmohan Singh was finance minister and liberalizing several sectors of the Indian economy, including the telecommunications sector. And Sunil won a license to start a mobile telephone company. And as they say in America, the rest is history. Bhakti Airtel today has a, cap, a market cap of 15 billion US dollars. It employs 15,000 persons. And I must say, as a director of Singtel, and we were wise enough in the year 2000 to make a significant investment in Bhakti Airtel, we are very happy uh, partners of uh, Sunil. But Bhakti Enterprises is not just Bhakti Airtel. He's also expanded into insurance in partnership with AXA, into retail in, in partnership with Walmart. But the thing that warms my heart, and I, I, I make this pitch to my friends in the audience from the Singapore private sector, is that he has never forgotten his humble beginning. He has set up a Bhakti Foundation. <coughs> Through the Bhakti Foundation, he has built 50 schools in rural India for poor children. He is also a benefactor of both the Indian Institute of Technology and the Indian Institute of Management. Um, my, my dream in Singapore is that before um, too long, that every Singapore company on the ST index would not only embrace corporate social responsibility, but would set up a foundation to emulate what Sunil Bhakti Mittal has done. Sunil, please. Thank you, Professor Kao. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Just one point of clarification, the $15 billion market cap is your part only, the Singtel part, yes. <laughs> well,
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I won't take too much time because uh, today is the day when uh, we must have the debate on this wonderful book, India's Century, and I want to give as much time to that as possible uh, involving the audience. So I think me and Mr. Pillai will make a few comments. I have been a part, a small part of this journey of this wonderful book because I have been on many flights with Minister Nath and I've seen him dictating uh, so much and I was picking up a lot of stuff and I said, is this all going to go into his book? Because some of the things that he was dictating were also not known to me. Being a very keen political observer, those are things which were very delightful from a reader's point of view. But when I finally read the book, I realized there has been a lot of editing. <laughs> and when I asked him, he said, that will be for another day. <laughs> but I must say that many politicians uh, don't dare to write books during their prime of their career. Many who do play it very, very safe. And most of them turn out to be rather insipid and boring. But this is one book which is a must read. It's a book which will give you a very different perspective of how India has been built, its complexities, the difficulties of building a big grand nation after independence, the diversities of our country from his home constituency, which I've had the pleasure of visiting once at his invitation, to what happens on the world grand stage. I'm going to give you a few vignettes of Mr. Kamal Nath. Me and some of our fellow members, CEOs, and I have not been able to report this back to Mr. Nath because I met him only this morning. We were in uh, London last week. We were at 10 Downing Street having a meeting with Prime Minister Gordon Brown. And towards the end of the meeting, he said, could you please tell Mr. Nath, the world is going to make a move on the agriculture. They will do what India wants. But can you tell Mr. Nath to please move on the Nama? <laughs> that is the non-agriculture part. That's the message from a head of a state straight to Mr. Nath. I was in Davos uh, chairing, had the privilege to chair the Davos uh, last year, the World Economic Forum. I was one of the co-chairs. Uh, in a very short notice, I had to chair a session with uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. And I was scrambling for some brief, and I could not find my CIA handlers. And I see Mr. Nath. I quickly go to him. I say, can you tell me what to say? And he looks at me. He says, since when has this turned? The industry is supposed to brief the ministers, not the other way around. <laughs> I say, well, you know, this is, this is Angela Merkel is surely going to talk about climate, and you are an expert in this. Standing for half a minute, he gave me a few pearls, which I, with great uh, elan, displayed from my stage <laughs> to, the, to the great surprise of many, because those few pearls that he gave it to me had the whole perspective of how India wants to engage with the world on the issue of climate change. Susan Schwab, Christine Lagarde, the finance minister of France, President Sarkozy, Angela Merkel, Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, President Bush, Everybody knows this gentleman called Kamal Nath. And many a times, those who don't ask, who is this man, Kamal Nath? Because he's one person who keeps on coming back on the discussion table across the globe every time. One person who, when things were not moving India's way, could assemble dozens of countries. Actually, I don't know the count. Mr. Nath will be able to say that. There were 60, 70, 80 countries who rallied behind India's position and turned the tables in favor of India on the WTO discussions. Ever since, India's position has strengthened on the WTO table. It is an incredible tribute to Kamal Nath, who has been able to understand very difficult pieces of world trade, because it needs a commercial acumen like nobody else, a legal brain, because most of the people who are on the table are legal luminaries, and more importantly, the pain for its citizens, common citizens, all rolled into one to be on the table to deal with those very, very important people. And I can tell you, he has done that extremely well. Today, when Prime Minister Gordon Brown says, please ask Mr. Nath to relent, he's asking a very large block of this world to relent because he leads that block. And when, at one point in time, in the area of agriculture, it appeared to me as an observer 
that India perhaps may be on a weaker wicket, he again brought out an ace and challenged openly from a stage, public stage, that if America can reduce one dollar of subsidy in agriculture, he was willing to relent. And I was puzzled. I said, that seems to be a very easy job. One dollar in absolute terms. One dollar less on subsidy if America was willing to do, India would relent its position. It's only later on I realized that the bound rate of subsidy was still a long way to go and where America was, and for them to reduce one dollar less would have meant significantly pegging their subsidies at a lower amount than the bound rate. That was the genius that Kamal Nath is. To my mind, therefore, for India to be ably led by Minister Kamal Nath, we could have not asked for anything better at this point in time. I must also give you some of his other important traits, which are very important for a country like India. My first glimpses of young Kamal Nath was, when I was also very young, was in the days of the Janta Party's Raj, the first non-Congress government which came to power. Mr. Nath spoke about India's rowdy democracy. Sure it is, and you have to make a lot of noise. He led an agitation on the streets of Janpath Road in Delhi and quoted arrest along with Sanjay Gandhi to make a very important point. That is my first vivid memory of young Kamal Nath. And he doesn't come from ordinary background. He chose to be in public life, coming from a very illustrious business background. He comes from a very strong business family, and that's why he has a very strong acumen of a businessman. But he chose to go and serve the people. And in his earlier days, he was articulate, he could bring his point out, and he could connect with the people. And when we, as a CI delegation, last year went to Chindwara, his uh, constituency, which is as rural and as backward as it can get in India, I was stunned to see how much of following he has in his own constituency. He can connect with those ordinary people on the roadside, like he would go and connect with the heads of the states on the other side. Rarely you will find a combination of a person who can straddle from a street side person at the lowest level of uh, poverty to the head of the state in no time. He is a able orator, he articulates his views well, he wins every election, he makes his party win most of the elections, and is a very important part today of the government of India. He was also a part of the same government where Dr. Manmohan Singh came in as the finance minister. He was one of the part, a part of that strong reformist team that India had started building in 1992. And of course, as you know, he is one of the top ministers in Dr. Manmohan Singh government today. This book will give you glimpses of his political side, of his international side. Some things that will not come through this book, I will just mention and conclude, is that you can actually talk to him about any subject. Airplanes, watches, motor cars, so much so that when I was building a home, he could tell me how to build your home. I am amazed at the capacity of this man, of how much he can absorb in his mind and use it at the right instance, at the right point in time. He is a living encyclopedia, and we are blessed to have in him as one of our young leaders of India today. Thank you. Um, I, I must apologize to Sunil for understating the market cap of uh, <laughs> Bhakti Airtel. In fact, the company is so big that um, Sunil, I would not be surprised if one of these days uh, you make a bid to acquire Singtel. <laughs> so I b better be extra good to you. You might be uh, my future chairman. <laughs> I forgot to mention that he's also the current president of the Confederation of Indian Industries, which is a very prestigious um, business organization, one of the best in the world. <clears throat> the next commentator I should introduce as a comrade Gopinath Pillay. You may wonder why comrade? Um, because Gopi and I were contemporaries at the university. Um, we were convicted socialists. We were members of the Central Committee of the Socialist Club. 
members of the editorial board of uh, the Socialist Student Newspaper, Fajr, which I'm sorry to say, um, Minister Balaji Sadasivan uh, subsequently banned. Um, and I guess we have never, well, we have, we have stopped being doctrinaire about our belief in socialism, but we have never given up our belief in egalitarianism and in social justice. And this is why, in addition to being a very successful and prosperous businessman with interest in education, logistics, and many other things, he has also devoted a lot of his life to serving the nation and serving the people. He has served, and, and I want to say this for the benefit of my Indian friends in the audience, without pay. He has served without pay, first as our High Commissioner to Pakistan, and, and more, more recently as our Ambassador to a country that um, President Bush does not love, Iran. Um, He's also served the cooperative movement in Singapore very well. And he was a former chairman of NTUC Fair Price, which is quite a unique institution in Singapore, so you know. It, it, it owns the largest network of supermarkets. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a cooperative. And through the NTUC Fair Price, it helps to moderate the rise in consumer goods, especially in times like this. So it's a great pleasure for me to call on Comrade Kopina Pillay to speak to us. Comrade Tommy, Minister Kamal Nath, Dr. Balaji, uh, Sunil, my friend. Tommy has given me five minutes and asked me to speak about Singapore-India relationship. Like him, I will do three things. One, I will take one minute to talk about the little I have interacted with uh, Mr. Kamal Nath, my impression. Two, a word about the book. And finally, three minutes for Singapore-India relations. So I would have fulfilled Tommy's request. First about Mr. Kamal Nath. I remember, I think it was in 2006, Mr. Kamal Nath was in Singapore, and uh, Mr. Lim Hung Kiang hosted lunch and a meeting with Singapore businessmen. I had the honor to be there. And uh, it was open for discussion. And of course, all Singaporeans who want to go to India and build things want to have land. And they think India is like Singapore. The government can, with the drop of a hat, acquire land because all of them made requests to Mr. Kamal Nath to acquire land and then on sell to them so they can build whatever they wanted to build. And Mr. Kamal Nath, being a very polite man, listened to it and nodded and said, well, we'll look into it. Then when it came to my turn, I said, well, Mr. Kamal Nath, I know that, Minister, you, you can't in India acquire land as you like, as we can in Singapore, but you may be able to do one thing, I have acquired agricultural land, which is not cultivated, which is barren, is useless, but it needs to be converted to industrial for me to build my container warehouses and internal container depots and my coal stores. I need your help. So he looked at me and said, ah, you seem to know how India works. Yes, we can help you. Then he, in his characteristic humorous way, he turned to his ministry secretary, whose name was Gopal Pillay, and said, from Pillay to Pillay, this should be easy. <laughs> but the story doesn't end there. A few months later, uh, again at a function, uh, we were having dinner, and Mr. Kamal Nath was in the VIP table. He looked around, and he saw at the distance I was sitting there. He made a beeline to me, and came and asked me, what happened to your land? Did you submit any papers to my ministry? I was amazed, I was floored that this man, who's the uh, Commerce Minister of India, should remember this little incident and come and talk to me about it. So I told him, look, Minister, in Singapore, we don't use the heavy artillery unless it's absolutely necessary. If a small arm fire will do, we try that first. 
so he sm laughed and went away. But that shows the commitment of the man to his job and his prodigious memory. Now, that's one, my one minute has gone. The second minute on the book. I think this is a great book. I've not had a time to thoroughly look at it because I was only given a copy uh, by the LKY school about a day back. But I found that it is, it catches the spirit of change in India. It, without going into the hype, he talks of how things have changed. For instance, he talks about Udyog Bhavan, where he sits, and talks about the changes that has taken place. I may add one more story to it, because many years ago, I used to go to Udyog Bhavan, because there was a joint secretary, who was a good friend of mine, a very good golfer, and a very handsome man like Sunil Mittal. Uh, and I had to fill up a book as I entered. I'm just telling you the state of how things worked in those days. So you had to fill up your name, time, person to see, reason for seeing. And when you left on the other side, you had to say, time of leaving, and reason for leaving. <laughs> so I asked this Sardar who was sitting there with this book, what do you want me to say? I'm actually going back to the hotel. My wife is waiting for me. Shall I say I'm going there to see my wife? So he said, Parwani, just put blank. Put. So I said, okay, I will put blank. I didn't write anything. So that was what it was but it has changed. That is what, that spirit is what this book captures. And there is a sentence in that book which I'll read to you at the end of my five minutes. Now coming to Singapore-India relations. It was never love at first sight. In fact, it was the opposite. During the Cold War, we were not really on the same side. We were on different sides. And there was very little that, uh, we had with each other. Even the economic relations was not so great. I see my friend Anup Singh, he will tell you. Uh, he was with STC in those days, State Trading Corporation. State Trading Corporation banned Singapore as a port of shipment for palm oil. Singapore used to ship a lot of palm oil, even though we did not grow palm oil. It was my unenviable duty to go to India and discuss with STC as well as the Ministry of Commerce on this problem because I used to work for the Singapore's counterpart of the state trading intraco, of the general manager. And on one occasion, the chairman of STC told me in rather pompous manner, we do not, as a matter of policy, import a product from a country that does not produce. You do not grow palm oil, uh, oil palm. We don't buy palm oil from you. So I said, that's a fantastic policy, very good. I said, uh, how much uh, oil palm does Holland grow? So he looked at me, but he got the drift because India used to buy palm oil from Amsterdam, and I had some evidence. So. It, is, it was that sort of situation. Politically not close, economically not close. Now that has changed. It has see, seen a, a sea change. After the Cold War, after the reform process came in, I think things have changed so much. And today, I think political uh, interaction between India and Singapore is very very deep, it's a very warm friendship. There is security and defense cooperation. And I think generally the atmosphere, uh, Go Chok Tong recently when he was in India, he said he didn't have a single issue to raise because it was a very cordial, or more than a cordial, it's a very warm relationship. This is great. On the trade side, I think the trade has expanded considerably. Uh, in the first 11 months of uh, 2007, 
I think the total trade was in the region of about 21.4 billion Singapore dollars. And that was a big jump from the previous 11 months. So it has been growing very well. One area where things have not been so great is investment. I think Singapore's investment in India is probably around $3 billion. As compared to Singapore's investment in China, which is, I think, $27 billion, with uh, Thailand, $14 billion, with Malaysia, $17 or $18 million, and so on. So it has not been. Now, this is the one issue that I wanted to. Why is it so? I think while political will is there for greater cooperation, I'm not sure it permeates down. For instance, I asked the question, even though the SICA agreement was signed in 2005, you would have read in the Singapore papers that it was only 2008 March that the banking side was open. Why? Why does it take three, three years for this to happen? And on the investment side, it has been rather slow. There are a number of reasons for this. But I think if I were to take two, I would say the first is there is a, a cultural difference. Singaporeans and the private investors particularly have got a can or not approach. Can you or can you not? They call it, they say can or not, you know. <laughs> if can, open a bottle of Mao Thai, celebrate. If cannot, Pack up the Maotai, leave, go to somewhere else where you can enjoy it. That is the Singaporean. In India, yes is not always a yes, and no is, always, is not always a no. But you must have the patience and the resources to wait it out. You know, if it is yes, don't celebrate, don't open Maotai or champagne. Wait to see how yes is going to work out. If it is no, You've got to see, is there some possibility? There are side doors, front doors, back doors. How do we approach it? Singaporeans have not understood this, and that is a problem. The second is the visual impact. Singaporeans like to see things like it is in Singapore, you know, that sort of nice green and well, uh, you know, regulated traffic and things like that. You land in Bombay, the airport is a story. Then you get onto the street, the international terminal is located in a worse place than the domestic terminal because you go through right through the slums. So by the time you get to Nariman Point, you have already made up your mind that this is, may not be the best place to be. <laughs> and if you are a middle rung officer coming to assess a project, and there is a remote possibility that you might be stationed in this country, you want to say, this is no good. Let's go back. <laughs> so that is what happens. So that is something that we need to address. I think a lot more work needs to be done between Singapore and India to, to get this going. CII comes here very regularly, meets all the political leaders, meets Chinese chamber, and so on. These are all very good photo opportunities. But I would urge them, look at the SMEs. There are thousands of SMEs which are doing very well, looking at opportunities to go out. They go to Vietnam, they go to Cambodia, they go to Laos, apart from China. China is a big draw, but the other emerging markets, and they take a risk. But culturally, they feel more at home. So there must be an effort made to get to this group, and I will assure you that things will move and the more investment will come. Because it's a pity when two countries are so close that the investment, and there are so many opportunities. I was, myself, I went in. There were hurdles, but I went into a business. I have compared that business in Malaysia, in Singapore, in China. Nowhere, and I mean nowhere among these countries, would you get the margins you get in India. The hassle, the headaches, the yes, the no, the maybe, you have to live with. But if you can tackle it, you have the resources, you have the stamina, 
and the mental ability to understand the situation, the bottom line would be worth all that problem. I want to end up, end with uh, one line that Mr. Kamal Nath mentions in his book, in his last chapter. Uh, and that is uh, uh, what he says about our Minister Mentor's position. And he says, that reflects the change in India. Uh, let me see. He says, the difference between the acerbic and sharp speech from Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew in the heyday and, fulsome, and the fulsome confidence that the retired wise statesman expresses for India today is the visible aspect or aspect achieved, aspect of India's transition from its past to modern India. That is a very relevant thing. The only thing I disagree with him on the, in that statement is I don't think Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has retired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A session. So um, would any, who would like to begin? Yeah. Do I need to do anything? I need to get people to stand this way. Yes, I would like to begin. Well, maybe I can volunteer people in the front row. <laughs> Gautam, you have a question? There's a lady there. Yes, yes, please. Could you identify yourself and address your question? Tell us who you're addressing your question, please. I don't think so. Okay, the mic is working. So my name is Erica Graffender. I'm part of the uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy MPA program. I am a global citizen, but today I would like to, you to consider me uh, a proud citizen of India. <laughs> and my question, actually you, you set things up very well today, speaking a lot about the environment and the economy, so my question relates to both. Um, understanding the challenge that India faces in balancing economic development and the environment, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, India reaching per capita emissions of other countries mm -hmm. that happen to have quite, I, I come from one, quite egregious uh, emissions mm -hmm. levels. Um, we would be in trouble if India had the same types of per capita emissions. And we know that two wrongs will not um, make the world right, and I think that uh, you probably agree given some of the things that have been said today. So uh, given um, that there will be costs to India's development, um, either in terms of reducing emissions or in terms of uh, the costs of climate change. My question is, do you ha could you provide us m with one to three progressive thoughts in terms of how India can truly a a address these two important issues? And I think I would also like to maybe hear after about uh, Mr. Mittal's um, okay. thoughts on, the, on All right. that Thank as you. well. Thank you very much. Um, Kamal, you go first. Well, India is a responsible member of the global community. We have always maintained that we are not going to reach on a per capita basis emission levels of the developed countries. Emission levels of the developed countries are much higher. We've been saying, of course we say, that uh, when uh, India is asked to do something which uh, impinges on its developmental process, uh, we can't do that. We can't stop our process of development. We must recognize that poverty is the biggest polluter. Uh, and in our developmental process, we are integrating environmental concerns. Now, you want to know three things. Let me tell you these three. Uh, India has one of the most ambitious programs uh, on wind energy. We are generating close wind to 5,000 megawatts on wind energy, one of the largest wind, wind energy, energy companies in the world. 
are uh, is an Indian company. On solar, when Tommy and myself worked in the environment, when we uh, at the Earth Summit and subsequently, we all committed ourselves to all the R&D and all the technology in solar energy. But at that time, the price of oil was $15, not $115. So after the Earth Summit, there was a loss of momentum yeah. on all the R&D in renewable resources. We found India was committed. Uh, India has, was committed to rene renewable resources. We found, what did we find in the last 14 years? That the countries who had the sun had no money, and those who had the money had no sun. So, uh, so we, did, we, we could not, there was not adequate research on this. Hmm. Now, when oil prices started rising, climate change got more scientifically determined. Not that it wasn't determined before, not that you needed. When we were working at it yeah. in 92, climate change was a threat, was determined by science. Only it was not accepted mm. by the biggest players. That's right. They said, uh, I remember being in New York once, and somebody told me, one, somebody got up and said, what do you want me to do, have one less beer? So I said, no, I don't want you to have one less beer. But I want you to stop your wasteful consumption. You must consume all the milk in the carton of milk you have. Don't throw away half, which you always do. Mm. Um, is the wasteful consumption patterns. Uh, that's the second thing. In India, we are doing away with any wasteful consumption patterns. As a poor country, we can't have, we cannot afford wasteful consumption patterns. That itself is a restraint. So whether it's renewable resource, renewable energy, like uh, uh, wind, wind and solar. solar, India also is now uh, negotiating uh, nuclear energy. We have our civil nuclear agreement with the United States, but it's, 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 it's called the Civil Nuclear Agreement. The name sounds very ballistic. It's nothing but an energy agreement. It's nothing but an energy agreement. And this energy agreement hopes to get India 60, 70,000 megawatts of nuclear energy. Yeah. And when we negotiated this, it was not just energy. It was really a recognition that when India established a nuclear capability 35 years ago, we told the world that we are a country of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, this is for peaceful purposes. We didn't sign the NPT. We haven't signed it till today. But we said we go beyond the NPT. <clears throat> Who signed the NPT? Iran signed it. North Korea signed it. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> right? And, uh, <clears throat> so this was recognition of India's track record of having a nuclear ability for 35 years, where we behaved responsibly, we behaved, uh, uh, we went beyond obligations, and we did it transparently. That's why the United States, which were the greatest proponents, the greatest, when everybody said, oh, India is going to do this and that, recognized this, and we had this nuclear agreement with the United States, and now we're looking forward to go to the NSG, to the Nuclear Supplier Group, move on, uh, and have 60 or 70,000 megawatts of nuclear energy, which is clean energy. And I think my personal view is, it, is certainly this, that all countries who have uh, behaved, who have conducted themselves with proprietary, conducted themselves uh, uh, with caution and transparently, would need to go into nuclear technology. Nuclear technology is also changing. The technology of 30 years ago or 40 years ago or even 10 years ago in nuclear energy has changed so dramatically. Uh, all the safety aspects have changed. So this transformation is taking place, and I would like to show you uh, that uh, India is committed, committed to its obligations under the Kyoto Protocol on the basis of its common but differentiated responsibilities, differentiated to have access to technology, uh, and uh, uh, to continue its growth process, uh, integrating these concerns. Thank you. Sanim? I'll just be very short on this one, uh, give you the industry's perspective. Uh, very <coughs> clearly, India is not uh, going to have a policy, as you said, two wrongs will make a, make a right. So we are not saying eye for an eye. The Western world has exploited uh, Mother Earth for 60, 70 years that have become economically very, very strong. Now, we cannot tell our industry, our people, not to use energy. 
Even in cities like Delhi, which is the capital of India, we have power shortages. There are mm -hmm. power outages for four to six hours in many, many uh, parts of Delhi. Industry has to almost entirely use captive generation for running their uh, uh, plants. So given those circumstances, India will have to exploit its fossil fuel. And what do we have? Abundance of coal. And coal which has a very high ash content. And that is bound to generate a lot of uh, uh, emission into the air. Western world will have to recognize that India's energy needs are for real. They are rising. It's a billion one people. They will need energy. More importantly, there are people outside the organized world, people who just burn wood or timber to keep their hearths uh, hot to make uh, their food every day. Those emissions are not even counted or controlled. There's a lot of emission coming from those. Mr. Nath said it very rightly. Solar can be exploited in India in a dramatic way. But the development of solar products cannot be done in India alone. The world will have to do it. This is a problem of the world. Carl Sagan, an astro scientist, said, the, there are no boundaries up in the air, and there will be no boundaries. So therefore, emission coming out of large countries like India or China are a world's problem, and the world will have to engage with countries like India. Give us technology, give us more nuclear power, give us more solar energy, and more importantly, large amounts of money will have to be directed toward this area. But India is responsible. It commits itself to be responsible. Common yet differentiated duties of India. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, another question, please. Hi, I'm Nina. I'm from the U.S. and I'm a student here. Uh, you mentioned early in your comments that one of the challenges India is facing is how do they steer growth where people believe things are God-ordained. Can you talk more about that? Well, India is a country which believes uh, in its own mythology and spirituality. I think uh, if there's one country in the world which has uh, several, uh, a crucible of spirituality, it's India. And it is this ethos of India where people believed that uh, it's in this uh, that uh, I have to go through this poverty or this distress uh, in this lifetime because we believe in reincarnation. And in our next life, for all the good we do in this life, the suffering, we'll have a better life in the future. That is the Indian mythology. Uh, it's because of that there's a great belief uh, that uh, 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 your, your fate is God-ordained. But I must say this, I've said that in my book, that it's not only that the world's perception about India is changing, India's perception about itself is changing. And people are not looking just for a better life for their children or grandchildren. They're looking for a better life in their own lifetime. That is the big change which has taken place. And while I have the microphone, let me, I need to respond uh, to my friend, uh, what he said about, uh, I think I should, I shouldn't let that pass, about uh, the, the, the windows and the side doors and the, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, I want to respond by not saying what, uh, uh, what I want to say, but saying about what somebody said uh, in Japan. I was in Tokyo, and when I was in Tokyo, there was the big, all the big business houses were there, the program, it was a dinner. And uh, I was asked, this was about two years ago, uh, it was a question-answer session like this. So I said, well, why am I being subjected to this? Let me ask you all a question, because here's the all the Japanese business community, and I asked them that, you know, you have so much investment in China, and you are now investing in India. Uh, what is the difference between India and China? Because I also want to do better. <laughs> so, as usual, you know, I thought nobody got up. <laughs> nobody answered. And I said, you know, I'll repeat my question. Um, <laughs> what is the difference between India and China? And one CEO, the chairman of a large company there, he got up and he walked to the stage and uh, I thought he'll speak in Japanese and I won't get the real punch of it. Uh, but he spoke in the English he spoke. Now, I'm telling you what he said. I'm not saying it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, you know, in China, easy to get in. In India, difficult to get in. Your point. I said, then? He said, but in China, Difficult to stay, easy to get in. India, difficult to get in, but easy to stay. It's in the book. Okay, uh, I think we'll take one more question. Please. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Raymond. And I'm calling. I'm from APEC Development and a research scholar for uh, Kaliga Institute in Orissa. Uh, my my uh, four short questions for the minister. Oh, four short. Uh, Can you yeah. just do one? Yeah, in one. Just do in one. one. One question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no cheating, please. One, one question. <laughs> when will India f open up for a fully uh, foreign-owned enterprise uh, system? And um, when will the capital markets be more liberal for foreigners? As well as when will the, <laughs> the title for Indian land uh, you know, be converted to English? Thank you. What the uh, last one? Title converted to English? Yeah, because I used to uh, to look at it and uh, it is in the, you call it Sanskrit uh, uh, instead of English. In Hindi. Ah, okay, right. Uh, well, your first question when India will open up, you know, if you uh, uh, open up the net and you see the policies on FDI, there are only four sectors where FDI is controlled in defense equipment in retail, uh, uh, financial services, financial services uh, atomic energy, and that's it. Otherwise, it's all open. You can come in, and most of them are on automatic approval. You don't need anything. Yeah. Even in those where there is approval needed, we normally um, ensure that it happens in 45 days. Of course, these days we are getting in, which we are trying to correct. We're getting in so many applications that we just don't have enough staff to deal with it. Uh, but uh, India has opened up these sectors. Now, one of the questions is, the, why is not retail opened up? I must tell you, again, the complexity of India. 97% of retail in India is in the unorganized sector. Uh, and out of that 97%, uh, a large part of that is out of the market economy. That means they're not a part of the banking system. Uh, they're not a part of the VAT system. They're out of the market economy. So there is the challenge in retail. Uh, otherwise, we've opened it up. In fact, uh, uh, two months ago, we further streamlined it, opened up many more things which were there in mining, etc. Uh, where your question of land title deeds, that they are in Hindi. Uh, I'm afraid they are in Hindi because that's our language. Uh, you know, it's easy. Uh, if you want to do business in India, you must do two things, right? You must taste the dust of India. Uh, but many people uh, want to do business in India without having tasted the dust of India. And then it's also reckoned with not just Hindi. You are lucky that you must have gone to a state where there's Hindi. You must go to another state, there'll be Tamil. Go to another state, there'll be some other language. <laughs> so uh, that is the beauty of India. And it will have to be in the vernacular language, as it's in every other part of the world. If you go to China, it'll, have to, it'll be in Chinese. If you go to Japan, it'll be in Japanese. But the good part is that you'll find many more people speaking in English in India yeah. than what you'll find mm -hmm. in many of the other countries. <laughs> um, the, the instruction given to me by Elizabeth Kwa, he said I must bring this to a conclusion, a happy conclusion at 5.20. So I think it's about time. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you very much for being here. I want to thank uh, Sunil and Kopi for your very good comments. And I want to congratulate Minister Kamal Nath for his very, very readable, enlightening, and enjoyable first book. I, have, I want to make three, three wishes for you. Come on. One, I hope you will play a positive and successful role in helping to bring the Doha round to a successful conclusion. Uh, my second wish... I hope you'll send a similar message to Susan Schwab also. <laughs> and my second wish is, I hope you will do your very best to bring to a successful conclusion the ongoing negotiations between India and ASEAN on the free trade agreement. And my third wish is that you will continue to play the positive and constructive role that you did in Rio in helping to bring the post-Kyoto negotiations to a successful conclusion before Kyoto expires in 2012. So those are my three wishes.
and uh, I thank you very much again for being here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.